Welcome to all of you. In this lecture, we look at one of the well-known films of the Italian master filmmaker Federico Fellini, and the film is Eight and a Half. We will have a very detailed discussion of uh, the movie. We will look at the summary of uh, the film. We will look at each and every characters, the themes, and uh, there will also uh, a discussion of the most significant questions and answers. Now we shall look at the very biographical details of the great uh, uh, Italian master filmmaker Federico Fellini. Federico Fellini was born in Rimini, Italy to Aida and Urbano Fellini. Rumors that Fellini was born on a moving train that was passing by Rimini later circulated as a result of a newspaper article printed decades after his birth, but friend and biographer Tullio Casey denies this. Since a rail strike began on the very day Fellini was born, making it impossible that his mother would have traveled through Rimini that day. Fellini's mother and father were neighbors who fell in love despite class differences. Ida was wealthier and her family disowned her when she married Urbano. Because Ida's family also had ties to Roman nobility, she and young Frederico, as a result, always felt her return to Rome was inevitable, though only Federico would move there permanently in the late 1930s. According to Kazik, Fellini did not often attend the cinema as a child, nor did he read many books. Nevertheless, he had an active imagination, distinguishing himself as a talented cartoonist early in life. While still in high school, he started a caricature shop called the Funny Face Shop, hoping to capitalize on the local tourism industry. Fellini was also a notably unathletic child never touching a soccer ball or learning how to swim, a rarity in Italy at that time. The early seeds of inspiration for films like Eight and a Half are clear in retrospect. As a young boy, Fellini named the four posts of his bed after the four major movie theaters in Rimini, already drawing connections between film and dreams. Although his family later denied it, Fellini also insisted that he once tried to run away to join the circus. After his move to Rome, Fellini began contributing cartoons and stories to the humor magazine Marc Aurelio. Once World War II was underway, he started writing scripts for a radio serial starring actress Giulietta Massina, who later became his wife and the star of his films, including La Strada and Knights of Cabiria. In 1944, Fellini met famed Italian director Roberto Rossellini, who recruited Fellini as a writing collaborator on the film Open City. This earned Fellini his first Oscar nomination and launched his career as a screenwriter and later a director. Because Rossellini was a pioneer of the Italian neorealism movement, Fellini adopted some of the movement's qualities while also breaking with the term in notable ways, in particular using a more personal storytelling style. This divergence is a major source of conflict in Eight and a Half, in which reporters, family members, colleagues rebuke the protagonist, a filmmaker for believing his personal life could be of interest to audiences. Following La Strada and Knights of Cabiria, both of which won Oscar for Best Foreign Film, Fellini went to direct such classics as La Dolce Vita, 
eight and a half and Juliet of the spirits. Now let us just uh, look at the summary of the film we discussed eight and a half. Let us look at the summary. Guido Anselmi, a 43-year-old film director, visits a fashionable health spa seeking treatment for his liver trouble. A number of people from the film industry, however, have followed him there in preparation for the production of his next film. On his first night, Guido has a dream in which he escapes from a car stalled in traffic and flies into the sky only to be yanked back down to earth by two film industry men. This is the very opening of the film Eight and a Half and we see the very traffic block in the screen and uh, that is of course the dream Guido Anselmi uh, has when he is taking rest in the health spa. Guido uh, from his dream wakes up as a doctor enters his room. During his physical exam, he coll his collaborator and co-screenwriter Domier enters and alludes to his displeasure with Guido's work. Guido enters the bathroom for a moment alone only to find a telephone ringing there. This we have in the very uh, first five minutes of uh, the film. And now we have uh, a lot of scenes from the health spa where the film is just uh, taking place rather the action of the film is taking place at the spring of the health spa the waters of which are considered an all-purpose cure guests line up for glasses of spring water and relax in the garden as Guido Anselmi waits for his water he has a vision of Claudia his leading actress but a plain looking nurse wakes him from his reverie by telling him to take his glass of water. As Guido turns away from the spring, he again meets Domier, who gives Guido a sheet of notes that criticize his script. In his tired, patronizing tone, Domier lists the script's faults and denounces the film for being uninspired. As Domier drones on, Guido spots his old friend Mario Mesaboto, who introduces him to his significantly younger American fiancée Gloria Morin. At a small train station, Guido reads Domius nods as he waits for his mistress Carla to arrive. When the train comes, he thinks for a moment that perhaps Carla didn't make the trip after all and feels relieved. He soon spots her on the other side of the train, however burdened with an enormous cart of luggage. He takes her to a small family-owned hotel in order to avoid the, the attention that they would receive at his own hotel. When they arrive, Carla orders lunch and as she enjoys a plate of chicken and chats about her husband, Guido becomes bored, reading a paper while he hums and smokes. Later in Carla's room, Guido directs a role-playing game in which he orders Carla to pretend she is a prostitute. As Carla sits up in bed reading cartoons and eating peaches, Guido has an eerie dream in which he meets his parents in a graveyard. They both express disappointment in him and after Guido helps his father 
step into a grave, he meets his mother, who suddenly transforms into his wife, Louisa, before he wakes up. This is in fact 25 minutes from the very beginning of the film. Later, back at his hotel, Guido leaves his room and shares an elevator downstairs with clergymen. When he enters the lobby, a barrage of managers, actresses and his collaborators demand his attention and he dismisses each one as quickly as possible until he meets Pace, his producer, who gives him a watch as a gift. Guido attends an evening entertainment review at the hotel where he watches Mesa Bota dance foolishly with Gloria. Bored with the music and irritated by complex questions that an American reporter asks him, Guido sports Carla, who sits at a far table in a failed attempt to be inconspicuous. A duo of mind-reading magicians begins its show, reading the minds of the hotel guests, and Gloria becomes frightened and refuses to participate. When the magicians read Guido's mind, they produce the words Asa Nisi Masa. A mysterious and apparently nonsensical message that is significant in Guido's past. The message causes Guido to recall a scene from past. That is, of course, his young boyhood days. He was in his grandmother's farmhouse in which he bathes in a big tub with his cousins and is put to bed by his doting aunts and his grumbling grandmother. Guido's young female cousin sits up in bed and tells him the words to a magic spell Asa Nisi Masa. This is in fact uh, 45 minutes since the film started, right? As you watch the film, of course you can understand when you come, come to that uh, uh, very uh, time uh, that is of uh, 45 minutes, you can see this repetition of this magical spell Asa Nisi Masa. At about 2 o'clock in the morning, Guido returns to the hotel lobby where the Concierge tells him that his wife Louisa telephoned. As he waits for the concierge to get her on the line, Guido talks with a French actress who has been trying desperately to find out more about her part in his film. He upsets the actress by refusing to give details about his film and saying, he must leave to talk to Louisa. As they talk on the phone, Guido realizes how much he misses Louisa and asks her to join him at the spa. Before he retreats to his room, he visits the production office where he answers the questions of this collaborators, Cesarino, who is working on set details and has a quarrel with his longtime friend and fellow director Conocia, whom Guido accuses of being obsolete. Once in his own hotel room, Guido ponders the still unfinished story of the film and has another vision of Claudia before falling asleep. A ringing phone wakes him up a few hours later. It is Carla calling from her hotel to ask him to attend to her because she has developed a fever. Guido goes back to sleep and doesn't waste it until next afternoon. He finds Carla sweating and delirious and he feels guilty for having dismissed her request. Later, he has a short meeting with the Catholic Cardinal 
in order to discuss his film. But the cardinal asks him only whether he is married and whether he has children. He doesn't have children. During the meeting with the cardinal, Guido's attention is drawn to a woman some distance away who reminds him of a gypsy woman, Saragina, whom he knew in his youth. He then has a daydream about the day he and other Catholic schoolboys were caught watching Saragina dance on the beach. Guido has coffee with Domir, who accuses him of being naive. And then he visits the steam baths with his fellow filmmakers, Mesabota and other family guests. Guido imagines the shrouded figures around him as expiring invalids and has a daydream about meeting the cardinal in a chamber of the steam baths. In this fantasy, the cardinal uses Latin passages of the Bible to instruct Guido to choose the path of the church. That evening, Guido sees Luisa at an outdoor auction being held at the hotel. He watches her for a moment before she sees him, and they greet each other, other uh, warmly. They dance together tenderly before Pace announces that they are going to visit the rocket launch pad that his construction team is erecting for the film set. Luisa suddenly becomes upset perhaps by something that a member of the production team has told her and refuses to sit with Guido on the drive to the set. As the group of filmmakers and their friends ascend the staircase of the launch pad, Guido consults with Rosella, his wife's close friend, about Luisa, and Rosella tells him that Luisa is confused and dissatisfied with him. Guido confesses that his film doesn't have anything to, stay, to say, and Rosella tells him to make up his mind about his life. Back at the hotel, Guido and Luisa argue about his infidelity before going to sleep in separate beds. The next morning, as Guido, Luisa and Rosella have breakfast together, Carla arrives in a ridiculously unknown horse-drawn carriage and sits nearby. Guido pretends not to know her, but it is obvious to Luisa and Rosella that Carla is his mistress. Defeated, Guido retreats into a fantasy that takes place in the farmhouse of his youth, in which all the women of to whom he has been attracted in his life devote themselves to his pleasure. At first, this harem seems harmonious. Its women contend with serving Guido. When an aging Parisian show girl throws a fit because she is being sent upstairs, the place where women in the harem are banished upon reaching thirst, uh, 30. However, Saragina declares a rebellion and Guido subdues them with a lion tamer's whip. Later that afternoon, Guido, Luisa and their friends watched the screen tests with the production team. While Domir alludes to Guido's inferiority in the French novelist Tendal, Guido fantasizes that Cesarino and his co-worker Agostini hang Domir. Luisa is furious to see that the mistress character and the wife character in Guido's film are clearly modeled after Guido's own mistress and herself. She walks out of the theater and when Guido follows her, she says she is leaving him. 
Guido returns to the screen test and reviews other actors who clearly represent his own real life acquaintances. Suddenly, Claudia, Cardinal's press agent, appears to announce her arrival. Claudia takes Guido for a drive, asks about her part in the film, and expresses her enthusiasm about working with him. Finally seeing Claudia in the flesh, Guido finds her breathtakingly yet disappointing. He knows that she will be neither the answer to the questions he has about his film nor the resolution for conflicts he wants to include in the picture. They park the car on a deserted road near the spring. Guido has one last vision of the ideal Claudia as the real version sits beside him and listens to his explanation of the film which describes a man unable to commit to nothing, just as he admits to Claudia that there is no longer part for her in his film, Casarino, Agostini, Pays and Cornacia arrive. They announce that there will be a press conference at the launch pad the next day and that shooting will begin in a week. The next af afternoon, droves of cars arrive at the launch pad. Agostini and uh, Cesarino practically drag Guido to the press conference and aggressive journalists shout questions at him all the way to the podium where Pace insists that he gave a speech. Overwhelmed by the pressure, Guido begins to hallucinate and sees Luisa in a wedding dress, asking him whether he will ever be faithful. Then Guido imagines that Agostini puts a gun in his pocket and Guido crawls under the table to shoot himself in the head. Guido cancels production of the film. Agostini directs the construction crew to dismantle the locket, rocket launcher and uh, Domier, unusually supportive, congratulates Guido on having made the right decision to give up his mediocre film. As Domier continues talking, Guido imagines that Morris, the mind-reading magician, tells him that his slow his, his show is just beginning. Guido sees Claudia, his aunts, Saragina, his parents, Carla, the clergyman, and the other familiar characters dressed all in white and blissfully smiling, walking together on grassy sand dunes. Guido is inspired once again and describes a new film that will portray his true self. He asks Luisa to accept him as he is and she says she will try. Morris and Guido direct all the characters in the film into a large circle which Guido persuades Luisa to join, then joins himself. The, live moves, the, the line moves off the stage, leaving only a boy, a fifth player, who resembles Guido in his youth. The boy directs the other musicians to leave the stage before playing a short solo and marching out of the spotlight alone. In fact, that is the end of uh, the film. And we understand that uh, this film is in fact a combination of realism and fantasy. In fact, uh, we uh, know that uh, uh, Fellini was influenced by Carl Jung and the psychoanalytic theory of Carl Jung and uh, the influence of Carl Jung, uh, the very psychoanalytic theory of Carl Jung is very much evident in the making of this film Eight and a Half. 
uh, in fact uh, we also understand that this film can be just uh, uh, discussed from the avant-garde uh, point of view as well as the surrealistic point of view because we have uh, the uh, mixture or uh, the uh, combination of realism and fantasy in it uh, and we see that uh, this is a film which is made by Federico Fellini uh, in his uh, maybe second half of uh, rather the second phase of uh, his career uh, early uh, career of course the uh, first phase of his filmmaking career he was influenced by Italian neo uh, uh, realism okay but uh, this film is a film which is made under the influence of uh, uh, the very uh, avant-garde movement in film industry or other the surrealist film uh, movement and we have the uh, con combination of realism and uh, fantasy in it right now let us just look at uh, uh, the film the rather the we are having a critical analysis of eight and a half as we uh, discuss uh, we understand that uh, this film deals with many themes one of the themes uh, eight and a half of Fellini is about is uh, of course filmmaking uh, we know that this is in fact uh, one of the best films of the world which is about film making many critics uh, just uh, praise uh, Fellini for making such a wonderful uh, film on film making and uh, uh, we understand that this is this film is exactly about uh, how a film is made so uh, before that let us just look at the very title of the film why is the film tie have uh, title eight and a half so uh, when we look at uh, the title eight and a half we understand that this is of course having some uh, autobiographical significance right La Fellini just wanted to make the title rather uh, autobiographical uh, and we understand uh, uh, that eight and a half refers to the very number of uh, films made by uh, Fellini on one side and uh, of course uh, this is uh, the very film that is uh, made by the very uh, actor that is the uh, director the character in the film that is Guido Anselmi. Guido Anselmi in the film is uh, Federico Fellini himself and uh, uh, we know that by 1963 Federico Fellini has made seven feature films and uh, of course uh, two short films so seven he has Fellini has by 1963 produced seven feature films and two uh, short films so short uh, these short films the two short films can be uh, considered as maybe half a feature film so that is so far seven and a half and the film that is made uh, in this film eight and a half is the eight and a half film right the eighth uh, film the eighth film of uh, uh, the director and uh, hence this is of course uh, similarly it is of course the eight and a half film of Federico Fellini and um, Fellini gives this uh, title eight and a half to uh, ensure that it has some autobiographical meaning now let us look at the themes like uh, the film is about aging on one side you have uh, the uh, uh, director who is 43 years Anselmo Guido who is 43 Guido Anselmi Guido Anselmi is 43 years and he is in his uh, middle ages he is aging and uh, this film the one of the themes of the film films is aging okay he loses inspiration he doesn't have much inspiration he is not very creative like he was before when he was young and uh, this film is about uh, uh, aging so also it's about cinema or uh, filmmaking so let us discuss eight and a half uh, as a film on cinema or filmmaking okay the nature of film itself dominates eight and a half since the film is largely structured around Guido's loss of faith in his creative voice throughout the film people offer unsolicited advice on cinema's role in the world the first to do so is the writer Domier who 
boldly states that cinema lags behind all other artistic mediums by 50 years. Later in the film, a clergyman tells Guido that cinema has the ability to educate or corrupt millions of souls. Even characters to whom we are only briefly introduced mercilessly, mercilessly probe Guido on the topic of art and life. This reaches its climax at the press conference where reporters harass Guido, asking him everything from are you afraid of the atomic bomb to do you really think your life can be of interest to others. Throughout the film, Guido remains silent on the topic of cinema with the exception of his conversation with Claudia to whom he confesses he just wants to make an honest film. Authenticity then emerges as the ultimate goal of cinema as opposed to the pure artifice or pure memoir. This underlies Guido's final monologue in the film wherein he realizes now everything's all confused again like it was before but this confusion is me as I am not as I would like to be. Fellini plays with the question of cinema's purpose formally as well particularly by using his own camera to investigate Guido's emotional journey through his dreams and fantasies. Often when we enter Guido's dreams or fantasies, the camera guides us in such a way that the fantasy initially appears to be real without the conventional dissolves or other filmic ending tr editing tricks. For example, when Guido imagines Luisa and Carla becoming friends, Fellini cuts directly from reality. Guido smiling at Carla to fantasy, Carla swinging, so that it is unclear at first whether we are being told the truth or lied to. This creates an explicit tension between the personal and the artificial as they are blended together in one depth cut. Such Formal choices constitute Fellini's formal meta-interrogation of cinema's ability to lie and tell the truth. Now, uh, one of the themes of the film is purity. Let us look at uh, the theme of purity in the film Eight and a Half. Purity, particularly as an analogue to the notion of truth is a strong theme throughout Eight and a Half. For starters, we meet Guido at a spa where water supposedly purifies one's system regardless of the specific ill with which it is played. Throughout the film, water and color white stand in as visual representations of purity. This is at work in the spa, which is built from white stone and tended by nurses clothed in white. This is also where we meet Claudia, Guido's ideal woman who likewise wears white, in one of Guido's fantasies. Later on in the film, Guido explicitly calls Claudia a symbol of purity and spontaneity. But when we meet her in person, she wears black and pox holes in Guido's ideas about love and truth. This is one of many ways in which Fellini complicates the notion of pure or objective truth when supposedly angelic Claudia tells him he is an unsympathetic character. For example, he realizes she is in his ideal woman, saying, you are a pain like uh, the others. Even the spa water, supposedly pure and healthy, makes Carla sick. Contrastingly, even Saragina, supposedly the devil, lives by the sea. 
using white as and water as empty symbols of false purity, Fellini sets up his audience for Guido's final realization that he must embrace the messiness of his life and cease to pursue perfection. Now let us look at uh, the theme of realism in the film Eight and a Half. Authenticity and realism, especially as they relate to filmmaking, are the abstract ideals to which Guido aspires, yet he is unable to master them. He explicitly mentions this when in the car with Claudia, to whom he confesses he just wants to make an honest movie. Her part in the film, he explains, will be both young and ancient, a child yet already a woman, authentic and radiant. In moments like this, it seems like Guido has a clear vision for the film as one of realism and honesty. Later in the scene, however, he admits that there is neither a part for Claudia nor a film to be made, and we see that his endeavor to make an honest film in response, of course, to accusations from his wife and friends that he is a liar is a sham. Throughout, the question of what genre of film Guido is making is a salient one. In the same breath, various acquaintances and critics ask him if he is capable of making a film about love, yet beg him to stop making films about his personal life. Later in the film, we find out he is making a science fiction movie about an escape from Earth after thermonuclear war, a premiere that seems steeped in artifice and surrealism. This desire for realism functions not merely as a genre of film, but also as a yardstick for the women with whom Guido interacts, many of whom constitute absurd archetypes of femininity. Kala is silly and cartoonish in her bombshell aesthetic, and Claudia manifests chiefly in Guido's imagination as his real woman. Unrealistic in her virtue, of course, these feminine archetypes each reach their climax in Guido's harem fantasy, which is complete with an aging can, uh, can, can uh, dancer and a Danish stewardess, neither of which are realistic but rather childish images of femininity. Ultimately, even as her authenticity is complicated by her on-screen portrayal, especially during Guido's screen test, Luisa is the most realistic of all the women in Guido's life, and consequently, he reaffirms his commitment to her. Uh, now, besides uh, looking at realism, let us look at dreams and fantasies in the film Eight and a Half. Fellini's Eight and a Half is as much about cinema and art as it is about dreams and fantasies. Our introduction to the film is through one of Guido's dreams in which he escapes from a suffocating traffic jam and flies away but eventually crashes down to earth, a fitting metaphor for the ups and downs of his creative ambitions. Indeed, to the extent that the film is structured at all, it is structured by the fluid transition from reality to Guido's subconscious. For example, when Guido chats with a clergyman at the spa, he sees a plum woman on a nearby hill prompting a recollection of Saragina. When we see after a hard cut and with virtually no indication that what follows is a memory, by blending reality dream and even fantasy so fluidly Fellini asks us to assign them the same value in understanding Guido's character. 
just as we see him from form an enduring bond with Saragina, who is otherwise a pariah, we also see him indulge in a chauvinistic fantasy in which his wife toils away while he is pleasured by a whole harem of women. Guido, in short, is complicated uh, dreams of fantasies are the primary way in which we access the boundary between his meek public self and his complicated private self. This sets up the audience for Guido's ultimate realization that he must embrace the chaos that is his selfhood represented by the film's final fantasy sequence. There, Guido's reality, dreams and fantasies collide on a single stage, offering a surreal, even macabre vision of what is to accept oneself. Now, let us look at the theme of mortality in the film Eight and a Half. Guido's fear of uh, mortality is a theme that haunts both his dreams and his waking life. In the film's very first sequence, for example, Guido escapes from a smoking car and crashes to the ground from a great height. In his next dream, he charged with his dead father about his tomb and later helps lower his father into a freshly dug grave. Even Guido's overarching goal to make an honest movie for the first time characterizes him as a character in search of legitimate achievement before he dies. This anxiety about aging is clearly present in his escapades with women, both real and fantastical, since nearly all of his mistresses, Carla, Claudia, the Danish stewardess, are younger than his wife, Louisa. This is notably untrue of Jacqueline Bonbon, the show girl who Guido orders to retire from pleasing him in his fantasy. Her retirement eventually galvanizes a rebellion amongst the girls in Guido's fantastical harem, since they believe it is unfair that Guido is much older than them, yet passes judgment of their on their age. Real life Claudia likewise calls Guido an old man near the end of the film, confirming his worst fear. Ultimately, Guido seems to accept his own aging and death just as he accepts the reality of his imperfect life. Indeed, the final sequence of the film, in which everyone from Guido's past and present march together in a circle, seems to gesture at the circle of life that will eventually call for Guido's death. The final shot of the film, wherein a little boy is left alone in the dark, likewise seems to symbolize the fact that even the little boy that we have watched grow into an old man, that is, Guido, will someday die. Now, let us look at uh, the theme of memory in the Fellini film Eight and a Half. Memory is integral to the way in which Guido relates to his past through dreams, fantasies and real life. It is notable that all of Guido's dreams and fantasies are populated by real people from his past and present. Even Claudia, to whom we are introduced in several of Guido's fantasies in which she is nameless, is eventually revealed to be a woman from Guido's past. As Guido navigates the production of the film, he will never make his often haunted by his past, and memories are often juxtaposed with reality, much like dreams are in the film. For example, 
when Guido charts with the clergyman at the spa is reminded of his childhood encounters with Saragina, triggering a lengthy remembrance of the Catholic punishment he received as a result. In episodes like this, it is evident that the past is never truly dead for Guido, but rather fluidly woven into his present and even into his dreams. Guido's memory of his father, for example, appears in a dream wherein his father coexists with the living Guido's mother and Luisa. This melding of memory with present experience culminates in the film's final sequence in which everyone from Guido's past and present join together for a celebration of Guido's life. This viscerally embodies the fusion of Guido's past with present as both are represented equally in this morbidly absurd circus. Besides, uh, we have the theme of religion in this film Eight and a Half. Let us discuss the theme of religion in the film Guido's complicated relationship into uh, spirituality or his complicated relationship to religion is evident throughout Eight and a Half since it's one of the primary ways in which Guido attempts to find meaning and authenticity in preparation for his film. Even the spa at which he meet Guido, we meet Guido is a religious domain. Before we even see Guido's face, we hear a doctor prescribe him a dose of holy water to drink every hour. He also visits the local clergy in the guise of doing research for this film, instead using these interviews to seek advice on his own artistic and personal life. In the first of these visits with the local cardinal, Guido lapses into a memory of Saragina, a seaside prostitute that he visited as a child. Through this memory, we see that Guido was caught with Saragina and subsequently punished by the church in ways that seem severe given the innocent nature of the childhood indiscretion. Even so, Guido props and is propped by the cardinal and other members of the clergy into separate meetings. In one of these meetings, a priest essentially tells Guido he doesn't believe cinema as a medium is fit to represent divine love. All this contributes to Guido's growing confusion about the role of cinema and art, a frustration that he only reconciles when he realizes that he must embrace the messiness of his life and its flaws. Ultimately, this conclusion seems rather Catholic in nature since it emphasizes the inevitability of sin. The finale of the film seems to lend itself to this reading since the image of Guido's friends and family marching dressed in white in circle to celebrate his life seems almost funeral in nature and perhaps even gestures at the ascent to heaven that we see Guido nearly achieve in his opening dream sequence. Now uh, we have uh, to look at the important characters of this film Eight and a Half. In fact, we have uh, a lot of characters in the film, m close to 20 characters, but let us look at some of the very important characters, the first 15 characters of uh, the film, eight and a half. Most important character is the hero, Guido Anselmi. Guido Anselmi is the film's protagonist, a renowned Italian film director. In the middle of making a film, he has not finished writing. Guido feels guilty about cheating on his wife and abandoning the Catholic Church and he is afraid of aging and creative 
exhaustion. Second character is Luisa, Gairo's wife who loves him despite his faults. Luisa is an intelligent, charming and beautiful woman who rejects the artificiality of Gairo's star-studded lifestyle and is fed up with his philandering and lying. Luisa brings her friends and her sister along with her to visit Guido. The third important character is Carla. Carla is Guido's mistress who has a husband of her own. Sumptuously feminine yet charmingly childish. Carla never challenges or reproaches Guido but her Taki's style and idiotic personality embarrasses him. Unquestioning and never demanding, Carla is Luisa's foil. The fourth important character in Eight and a Half is Mario Messambota. Maria Messambota is Guido's friend who is annulling his marriage so that he can marry his new fiancée Gloria, a friend of his daughter. To Guido, Mesambota. Mesambota is a pathetic figure who embodies the director's fears about aging. Next character is Gloria Morn Morin. Mesambota's wife-like young fiancée Gloria Morin is an aspiring actress and a philosophy student. Gloria alternatively murmurs coquettish and pseudo-intellectual nonsense. Next important character is Claudia. Claudia is an actress whom Guido considers for the leading role in his film. Although Claudia's beauty is ideal, and her presence dreamlike, Guido does in, um, uh, uh, find her suitable for the film and she is in fact uh, a representation of youth, purity and uh, healing in this film, Eight and a Half. The seventh character is Rosella. Rosella is Luisa's best friend who accompanies Luisa to visit Guido at the spa. Guido calls Rosella grasshopper because like Jimmy's cricket in Pinocchio, she cares for and advises him. She tries to lighten the tension between Guido and Luisa. She is also a clairvoyant who is very, very uh, talented to predict future. The eighth character in the film, Eight and a Half, is the French actress. She is a famous actress whom Guido has requested to play the Carla character in his film. The actress insists and demands to know more about the part, convinced Guido that she is inappropriate for the role of the easygoing Carla. Her agents nagging for contractual details and her own nervous presence are a constant reminder of the pervasiveness of Guido's occupation. The ninth character in the film is Domier. Domier is Guido's pretentious associate screen writer. Domier continually appears without warning non challengely describing the film's flaws. His criticism is frustrating to Guido but delightful for the audience for it is it is it, it scrutinizes the direction of both Guido's film and eight and a half itself. The vain arrogant Domier is always eager to 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 smooth with the press and with beautiful actresses. The Tenth character is Saragina. Saragina is a large gypsy woman who lives on the beach during Guido's boyhood. Guido and other boys visit Saragina surreptitiously to hear her 
sing and dance the rumba. Saragina plays a significant role in Gairo's sexual awakening as well as his straying from the Catholic Church. The eleventh character is Pace, Guido's producer and a constant source of nagging pressure. Pace insists that production move forward regardless of its state of confusion. His young, moronic girlfriend often appears beside him, lapping ice cream. The twelfth character is Konochia. Konochi is an old friend and a creative collaborator of Gaido's who threatens to quit working on the film out of frustration with Gaido. Gaido sometimes finds Konochia's influences to be too outdated for the production of the film, which he wants to feel new and fresh. Konochia's presence exasperates Gaido's fears of becoming creatively important himself. Thirteenth character is Cesarino. Cesarino is a member of the production team and the casting director. Cesarino is a good friend of uh, Guido and their pleasant encounters are evidence of the comfort Guido can find in his work. Next character is Morris. Morris is a mind reading magician and and, and an old friend of Guido. Morris helps Guido find his creative inspiration and encourages him to follow it. He is Domi's foil. Next, uh, we have a beautiful woman in the film. We have a mysterious woman who is staying at the Spa's hotel. In real life, uh, Borato was an icon of beauty in Italy and Italian viewers would recognize her as an old Moric star. Her likeness also appears on a statue of uh, the Virgin Mary in a memory sequence of Guido's childhood. The next character is Bruno Agostini. Another member of the production team, Bruno Agostini, uh, is of the same age or rather younger to Guido is always impeccably dressed and coldly efficient. Agostini is Conochia's foil. Next important character is Jacqueline Bonbon. Jacqueline Bonbon is a retired Parisian cabaret dancer who, like Saragina and the beautiful woman, contribute to Guido's first romantic experience. Jacqueline is older than Guido's other love uh, interests and she contributes to the motif of uh, growing old. Okay, now that we have looked at uh, the most important characters of the film, let us look at uh, the uh, significant uh, symbols uh, and motifs in the film. Eight and a half. The first symbol is black and white motif. Black and white motif in the film. Even as the entire film is shot in black and white, Fellini uses the colors of pure black and pure white carefully. Claudia, for example, always wears all white when uh, she appears in Guido's dreams. Yet when sh we meet her in the flesh, later in the film she wears all black symbolizing the frustration of Guido's unrealistic notion of the ideal woman. Saragina likewise wears a white scarf in her hair the second time Guido visits her at uh, the beach. This represents the silver of humanity, uh, the, the sliver of humanity and purity that he finds in her despite the church's denunciation of her as the devil. Indeed, Guido himself always wears a black and white suit, a symbol of his internal friction between good and evil. In short, white and black often represent the complex relation of good and evil, purity and chaos. Uh, now we have the motif of film within a film in eight and a half. The concept of a film within a film is central to 
eight and a half since Guido's character and the film he is trying to make serve as a kind of proxy for Fellini's own experience trying to make the film that we are watching. Going even f further, certain elements of Guido's subjective experience like memory and dream operate similar to a film as images that project the inside and, and inside feelings and desires. Fellini's camera often accents this by cutting straight into these segments as if they are films that Guido himself is watching unfold. Now we have this space ship symbol. Let us discuss the space ship symbol in the film Eight and a Half. The elaborate tower that will serve as the space ship set for Guido's science fiction film bears notable associations with the biblical story of the Tower of Babel, which at the time of its construction was to be the tallest building ever made. When construction workers begin tearing down Guido's space ship, therefore it aligns with God's demolition of the Tower of Babel on the grounds that it was made by men who believed themselves gods. In this way, Guido's space ship set symbolizes the hubris of human progress and creative ambition. Now, uh, the character of Claudia is again a symbol. Let us discuss the uh, symbolic significance of the character Claudia. Although Guido explicitly mentions that Claudia represents purity and spontaneity to him, she largely functions as a symbol of Guido's ideal woman and the frustration of such a concept. When Claudia appears in Guido's dreams and fantasies, for example, she wears white and even a bridal veil representing purity and idealism. However, when we meet her in person, she wears all black and ultimately laughs at Guido's inability to understand love, emasculating him even at his lowest point. Now let us look at uh, the symbol of water in eight and a half. We see water uh, as a symbol in this film of uh, Federico Fellini, water as a symbol. In eight and a half, water is an important symbol of purity and of complication of that purity. The spa at which we meet Guido, for example, pushes holy water as a cure for all bodily and mental ills, but that same water later makes Carla sick. In addition, Seragina, whom the Catholic clergy of Guido's youth believe is an impure witch lives by the sea. In this way, water which usually bears religious connotations of baptism and purification becomes complicated by its polluting effects, trying, tying into themes of religion and truth that Fellini plays with throughout the film. Now we have the allegory of the Tower of Babel in the film Eight and a Half. Alluded to through the giant spaceship that Guido has built for his film is the biblical allegory of the Tower of Babel in which mankind becomes too confident in their own abilities and therefore loses faith in God. They demonstrate this by building a tower tall enough to reach heaven, but God confuses them by making them speak different languages and they are unable to complete the project. Guido's spaceship resembles this tower since it's an act of artistic hubris that eventually crumbles when he realizes he is creatively incapable of finishing the project. Now let us just look at uh, the very significance of uh, the film that is of course uh, rather a critical uh, appreciation of the film. Eight and a half 
is a person's soul search and a probe to find peace in life and artistic excellence. Guido is in the shackle of his memories and visions which thwarts all his attempts to break free. His artistically sterile face has strong reasons connecting to his past. Fellini is making an inter inter intentional attempt to dwell deep into a person's psychological terrain and represent his life in the form of shattered images. The narrative is quoted in humor as well. According to film critic Roger Ebert, Eight and a Half is the best film ever made about filmmaking. The complex psychological trauma a director has to undergo during the creative stage is meticulously analyzed by Fellini. His judicious employment of surreal visions must be taken note of. In the very first scene of the movie itself, Guido is shown flying high and his peers finally bring him down. This clearly indicates the protagonist's effort to soar high on the wings of his artistic brilliance, yet he is bowed down by his own circumstances and people in his life whom he cannot do away with. Another significant fantastical scene involves all the women in his life of Guido assembling in a harem. This chaotic scene helps the audience to understand the emotional turmoil which is simmering inside Guido. The last scene of the film where Guido and his wife join the dancing peers can be seen as the solution he has finally found out after all these years of uh, or, other, or rather after all these days of frustration and emotional struggles. He realizes it is impossible to escape into imaginary world of art by breaking free from his real life. Federico Fellini has once stated that the basic requirements for being a director include curiosity, humility before life, the desire to see everything, laziness, ignorance, indiscipline and independence. Guido can thus be seen as Fellini himself and the movie is an ode to his struggles to attain creative independence and excellence. The title of the film refers to the number of films directed by Fellini until then. By 1963, he had made seven and a half films, seven full-length feature films and two short films. The working title of the film was A Beautiful Confusion and later he decided to give an autobiographical meaning to the title. The cast includes Marcello, Mastriani, Guido, Anouk, Aimi, Rosella Falk, Sandra Milo. The screenplay was written by a team of four including Fellini, Tullio Pinelli, Ennio Flaiano and Brunello Rondi. Gianni Di Venanzo was the cinematographer and editing was done by Leo Cato, Cato, Catoso. Now uh, we will just uh, uh, look at the irony in the film the eight and a half. Uh, one of the very, very ironical uh, situation in the film is Guido's personal life and it can be an example for situational irony. We see a lot of situational irony in the film eight and a half and uh, uh, one of uh, the uh, instances of uh, si situational irony is Guido's personal life. It's ironic that numerous critics of Guido's film argue that it's an arrogant, uh, it's in fact uh, uh, arrogant to make a movie about his personal life or childhood memories. Yet the film we are watching, uh, that is uh, Eight and a Half, is largely autobiographical and therefore centered on his own personal experiences. Now we have Guido's film. It's ironic that Guido's 
critics and allies alike fight over how to define his film in excruciating detail. Yet Guido is unsure of what the film he is making is about. Even admitting to Claudia, there is no film, there is nothing anywhere. Now we have uh, the uh, situational irony in Visit to the Cardinal. It's ironic that uh, a, uh, a, a clergyman uh, a, a clergyman uh, just uh, tell, uh, uh, tells Guido that a prince of the church would never meet with his protagonist during a uh, spa treatment. Yet the cardinal later meets with Guido while they both undergo a, a spa tre treatment. Now we have the dramatic irony in the press conference scene. Uh, it's ironic that just after Guido admits for the first time that there will be no film, he must face a crowd of uh, reporters and friends who interrogate him about the hubris of uh, making a film. Okay, so now we uh, come to the end of uh, the discussion of uh, this uh, great film by Federico uh, Fellini. Uh, thank you all for uh, listening. Uh, have a wonderful day. May God bless you all.